I first met Siki Chen at a Lightspeed CEO dinner hosted by Jeremy Liu, our mutual investor. We bonded over our love of product design and fascination with customer engagement. Since then, I've followed Siki's career from Zynga product lead to fast pivoting startup CEO to VR executive. I love how Siki's ideas about vision and leadership keep evolving. This guy is always learning. Recently, Siki stopped by our Game Thinking Masterclass to give us a talk that he gave internally at his amazing company, Sandbox VR. I love this talk and think it deserves to be shared. So here it is, Siki Chen on presentations. We do these all hands monthly and uh, the, we decided what we want to do at all these, at these all hands is have a, a random member of the team teach the company something um, every month uh, because we felt like we all knew something or all were really good at something that the rest of the company didn't know about. And we thought the first one, it probably makes sense to just show people how to do a really good presentation. Um, and so that was how this was created. And I spent about a day and a half working on this and I thought it might be useful for a larger audience. So, so I'll just get started on presentations. The goal of a presentation is to deliver useful and fun facts to your audience. And uh, here are some tips. Be interesting, do not be interesting. Uh, teach your audience. So you wanna make sure each slide has a ton of facts. Your audience is looking to learn something new. So make sure you do that. Uh, be funny, make jokes. People are bored. They don't want to uh, hear you not be funny, so do that. And be confident, do not be confident. That's pretty much it. The end, any questions? Just kidding. Obviously, that is not a fantastic way of presenting. You see all of these slides with a ton of bullet points and it's mostly boring and I hate it and I don't want to sit through them. Um, I think ultimately the art of presentation is not about delivering facts, making jokes, acting confident, but it ultimately is the art of storytelling. And storytelling to me is magic in a very real sense, like not pretend magic, like real world magic. And the reason why I think so is if you think about what magic is, you know, you say some words, you say a spell, you, you, you cast a spell. And what happens when you wave that magic wand, you say these magic words is things happen, right? People float, you control things, the world changes. And that literally is what storytelling is. You think some thoughts in your mind and those thoughts become words out of your mouth. And those words become light and sound waves through your expression and through the actual audio of what you're saying. And they enter the senses of your listener. And those senses are connected to their mind and your mind through your thoughts are altering the inner workings of their mind. And by altering the inner workings of your listener's mind, you ultimately affect their physical actions. And so if you think about it that way, storytelling is actually a real life superpower. It's the closest thing to magic and a superpower that exists for real. And that's why I think the goal is ultimately to move people through emotions to action, whether it's to remember you, to invest in you, to be entertained, to make a decision, to be liked, to agree on something. So if we want to do that, if we want to accomplish that goal of moving people to action through a great presentation, the first question to ask is how do people decide to take action? How do we decide to do anything? And so here's how we make decisions, right? So we make an observation about the external world, the reality around us. For example, gee, I wonder how people who got to good schools are doing in life and you collect those facts. Well, they seem to be doing a lot better than your average person. And then you form an opinion based on these facts in the real world. Therefore, it is my opinion, based on the real world events that I've observed through experience, is that school is useful and good. And these opinions help me make rational decisions. Because school is useful and good, I decide to do well in school. I mean, that is how we make decisions, right? Right? 
Um, <laughs> not really, right? So Stanford did this really, really interesting study. Um, and there's a link at the below the presentation. Um, if, if um, this current deck is actually uh, on my Twitter, it's later, so you can follow along or you click through that study. But um, what they did is basically they found um, a population of students within the Stanford campus and they asked them their opinion about a political issue. And for each group, they showed uh, carefully researched uh, uh, papers contradicting their views. And what happened is the people with those views, uh, they didn't, they weren't convinced by the facts. They actually felt stronger about their own opinions. Um, and this has been replicated over and over again in many different scenarios. Uh, facts don't really change people's minds. They, we just think they do. And we think that they do if the facts already agree with our own opinions and we feel like these facts should also change another person's opinion. But we've all experienced this where someone sh showed as a contradictory fact, we have reason to doubt it, we think it's unreliable, and uh, we dig deeper into our own opinions. And that's perfectly natural. Because how we actually make decisions is based on emotions. Our experiences trigger emotions, which then create our deeply held opinions. So the way it actually works is this. You have these experiences, right? So for example, my dad got a PhD in physics and our family grew up very poor. Therefore, I have created these emotions uh, because it doesn't feel good to be poor. And so my opinion based on those facts is that school is largely a waste of time. We then use these opinions to make decisions and ultimately act. So, and this happens unconsciously. So based on our existing opinions formed by emotions, uh, we take a fact, we fit a new fact. So people who get good grades in school on average are more successful. That is in fact a fact. But because I have an existing opinion, I try to fit, fit that new fact into an existing opinion that I have. Okay, that may be true, but school is still a waste of time for me because I learn better in other ways. I know that. Um, so school is still a waste of time. And based on that existing opinion, I'm going to make a decision that feels good or the least bad. In this case, the decision I always make is I'm going to skip class and go play video games instead. Felt great. Uh, not based on objective reality, but if it feels good and it fits into an existing opinion that was driven, frankly, by emotion. Of course, the exception to this form of decision making is you. We, all of us, are rational and objective. But my point here is that everyone else in the world, it's a useful filter to believe that that is not the case because it isn't the case. So if the goal of a great presentation is to create emotions that ultimately persuade people to take action, how do you do that? Well, so when I think about the structure of a great presentation, I ultimately think about it in terms of a story. A great presentation is a story. And I think of it in three components. One is what I call the bones. This bones is a story itself. It's a structure that shapes your overall narrative, your presentation. And over the bones is the skin. The skin is your visuals, is what people see and read when you present them, present a live, or you email your deck to an investor. And I think the most important bit is a soul. It's sort of the intangibles, the quality without a name that makes an okay presentation or a good presentation something magical and unforgettable. So we'll talk about each of these three things. So the bones is a story. What makes for a good story? A good story starts with a theme, right? A theme is a big idea and inspires emotion. Companies can have themes, presentations can have themes, movies have themes. The, the theme of Google is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful incredibly inspiring goal, very ambitious, may never be completely accomplished, but inspires emotion, at least for me, because I'm a dork. Um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. The company I currently work for is called Sandbox VR. Our mission is to bring the holodeck from Star Trek to every neighborhood in the world so that you can experience and go on adventures together and uh, be transformed with your friends and your coworkers in teams to go on adventures that previously weren't possible. And the goal for this presentation, the theme of it is 
uh, to convince you that great presentations trigger emotions that move people to action. And I built an entire presentation around this idea. Starting with this idea, you can then sketch a dramatic arc around that theme. So there is actually a universal structure of good stories since human beings started telling them. And if you think about all of the classic legends of stories, they more or less follow this model, which is you start with the world as we know it, exposition. Um, in this case, the world as we know it is presentations around delivering facts that are fun and useful. The rising action usually has something changing in the world. Um, in this example, presentations are actually about emotion uh, and creating action from those emotions, and here's why. Then there's a climax. The world has changed, and it will never be the same again. Um, so hopefully, this knowledge gives everyone a new superpower in their ability to affect the world through communication. And the resolution is, this is what that story has meant to you. Please practice the art of presentation. It will make you more powerful as a person. Um, once you have this arc, you've got to support it with actually good writing. It is not possible to teach um, great writing in a span of about five minutes, but there are some really good principles that I think are important that all good writing shares. So I'll just talk about a few. So the way I think about what writing is, is I think of writing as the act of thinking outside of your brain. Um, and Ted Chang actually had this really great short story um, recently about the introduction of writing into this uh, tribe that previously didn't have it. And uh, the analogy he drew was, you know, it's very similar to, it's, almost, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an augmented technology almost in the sense that, you know, if we have these glasses that record everything that ever happens to us and it's almost like an external brain, if you think about it, when writing was first introduced, it was a very similar concept. Um, you're able to store memories and on pieces of paper and move them around physically, and previously you only were able to do it in your brain. And so I think writing is actually the act of thinking outside of your brain. And what that means is by writing well, you will think better because you can manipulate your thoughts on paper. And if you think better, have good thoughts, uh, you will write better. And so it starts, writing isn't just writing, it starts with a something interesting to say, say and interesting thoughts in your head first. And doing one well helps you do the other one well as well. Um, good writing is simple. I think this is super important because everyone, can, I think, can identify with this in a sense that when we are good at something, whether it's cooking or writing or presenting, it feels easy to us, right? We if we, we all, all are good at a thing that seems easy to us, where, and, but other people look at that and, and we think, they all tell you, how are you so good at it? That's so hard for me. And I think that is true for anything that you truly understand. And if you can write it simply, that means you, can, you understand it well. And if you can't write it well, then usually means you don't understand it as quite as well as you think. And so good writing should be simple, very clear, very easy to understand. And finally, good writing has a rhythm. Um, there is a tempo, a beat. There, it's like good music, right? It's, if you um, listen to good music, there's a structure to good writing and there's an equal structure to good presentations as well. Um, it's very hard to train and the only way to get good at it is to practice. If you think more by writing, if you write more, it will improve your musical abilities um, as a presenter and will improve your thinking as well. Um, so those are some of the tips, I think, to write better. Um, the second big component is the skin, the visuals. And this is actually probably the most simple thing to do that most people don't. Um, the way I think about it is don't make people read. Um, people don't like to read. People, if you're presenting something, people are looking at you, at what you have to say, and if you're simply going to read off of the slide, then people might as well have not, uh, what's the point in them even showing up, right? Um, so we talked about this. So the way I like to make our slides is lots of slides, big pictures, few words. Um, for pitch decks in particular, if you do some research on what the standard format of pitch, pitch deck is, uh, the standard format is 10 slides, 
you want to have a team slide, a competitor slide, a finance slide, talk about your vision, talk about the problem. Um, and I've looked at a, a lot of those slides and I just don't think they're very good. As I don't think I've raised um, in terms of financing now, I think close to $80 million for various companies I work with or for. And uh, I don't think, I think the shortest deck I've made was about 30 slides. The Andreessen Horowitz uh, Sandbox VR deck, I think had a little over 50 slides. Um, I don't think that's a really good rule. Um, what matters isn't the number of slides or a particular format, but you know, I made slides the same way I make presentations is what emotions do I want to draw out of the audience? Um, and I remember talking to Vinod Kosla from Kosla Ventures and I asked him, this is like seven years ago, how he makes investment decisions. And I'll never forget his answer. He literally was one word. He said emotion. And at the time, I didn't really get it. Um, I do get it now, right? Like emotions are powerful because that's what forms opinions. That's what drives people to action. And by having more slides or fewer slides, what have you, if you can, as long as you can maximize the emotion you create in your audience, that's what's going to convince people. And that's what's going to make them make one decision over another. It's not facts. As you notice, I like to have one big idea per slide, right? Uh, we have very short attention spans where the audience is trying to look at you, pay attention to you and look at a slide. Don't make them think too much. Emotions aren't about thinking. You almost want to repress the conscious mind in order to affect people emotionally. And one of the ways to do that is make sure to focus on very few things. Uh, your headlines alone should tell a complete story if you have one idea per slide. And one of the things that I actually do whenever I make a presentation is I will read the entire deck and I will only read the headlines. And I want to make sure that if I just do that, that it still tells a complete story, that it's in complete sentences, uh, as if, if you put just the headlines into paragraphs, it still communicates exactly what you want to say correctly. Um, doing that makes sure, helps you make sure that one, you have one idea per slide, but two, it makes sure that your transition between slides are smooth. Um, so that's a really useful tip for me when I, whenever I create a presentation. Uh, the third thing is the intangibles, what I call the soul, but this is uh, the, probably the most difficult thing to get right. Uh, this is the art part of a presentation. I have a few tips here. The first is, is to be a craftsperson. Put more effort into it than it's probably worth. You know, and the reason why this is important is if you look at the world out there, good is everywhere, whether it's in products or companies or in presentations. There's a lot of good presentations out in the world and on the internet you can easily find them. But in that world, magic is still super rare. And so if you're going to do anything, build a product, build a presentation, the goal, the benchmark should be that it's magical. And even if you fall short of that, at least you end up with something great. And what is magic? What does that look like? Sometimes magic is just someone spending more time on something than anyone else might reasonably expect. Um, or I think Penn actually said it a different way more time than it actually seems like it could possibly be worth. Um, and I think that's true, right? Like if you put more care into something and put more effort into something, you are able to create something that's not just good, that is something that will actually stand out in an incredibly noisy world. And for that reason alone, it's worth it. The final thing is to be comfortable. There's a lot of advice. Um, the most common piece of presentation advice is probably be confident. Um, it's very difficult to just be confident um, if you're not confident, right? Um, and if you try to pretend to be confident, you end up overcompensating. Uh, you end up feeling inauthentic um, and nervous and people can tell. Um, what I found useful is when I tell myself how I should present and I get super nervous every time I present uh, anything um, is to just be comfortable because it's easier to pretend to be comfortable like we all know that feeling, even if we're not confident of what it is to be comfortable when you're snuggled up in bed and you feel at ease, uh, then it is to pretend to be confident because not everyone sees them as a sort of used car, sees themselves as sort of a used car salesman who can just be doing a hard sell. And that's not what you want to do anyway. You want to be comfortable so you can create that sense of authenticity and have people really connect with you. And the easiest way to be comfortable, one is to pretend to be, the other way is to just practice a lot until you are comfortable. 
So don't worry too much about feeling confident. Even if you don't, nobody does. I don't know. Maybe someone does, but I certainly don't. Um, but if you practice enough such that you're comfortable with it, I think usually it goes a lot better. And the final thing is to be vulnerable. The vulnerability, giving a piece of yourself that you w wouldn't normally share that is not necessarily to your advantage. Um, it's a thing that creates comfort and credibility. It's how we make friends. And it's useful to turn every weakness into an opportunity in so doing, right? So, you know, everyone out there, how do you stand out? Everyone out there leads with their strengths. They talk about how awesome they are, how awesome the product is, how awesome the company is, here's why you should invest. But what I found in almost every presentation is leading with the weaknesses is works in our favor because by doing that, you immediately disarm the listener, right? Because when you're trying to pitch an investor or someone, um, they're always looking for, here's what is the reason, what's the problem with the company? What are you trying to hide from me? Why I shouldn't invest? And I have all these objections. If I say them, well, the person presenting to me get offended at it. So you're worried about all these things. But by leading with the weakness, you completely disarm that entirely. And so we are a VR company at Sandbox VR. Uh, we do virtual reality experiences in various retail locations. And so the first thing, the first slide in our deck is literally VR is a disappointment, um, which is like the elephant in the room that everyone is thinking whenever you're trying to pitch a VR company. And when we have an elevator pitch with an investor, we say this, we say, um, you know, there's like three sectors, and at least it was true a year ago, there's three sectors that aren't hot right now. One is virtual reality. Uh, no one wants to invest in VR. Uh, content, nobody really use, usually wants to invest in. And retail is usually not a venture back comp backable company. We are all three at the same time. So uh, this is probably the most unfundable company in the world, but hear us out. Um, and they do, right? Um, so it was useful for us. Leading with a weakness is kind of a good idea. That's, in summary, the, some of the principles that I use when I make great presentations. The goal of a presentation is to move people to action. And I think a great story well told inspires us to take risks. Magic Leap was able to raise a billion, two billion dollars off of a great story. You know, inspires us to go to other planetary bodies. It can unite a country or, you know, this is our CEO and founder and it can even change the world. So that's my spiel. Hey, innovator, wondering what innovation advice you should follow? It turns out that one size does not fit all. Take our innovators quiz and get your free customized cheat sheet packed with smart innovation tips that are tailored to you. Go to gamethinking.io slash quiz to get started.